I did have a home away from home. So when, when I was very little, my parents bought a little battered uh, farmhouse in the, in the south of France. And so that's where we would go and spend uh, long summers, yeah. Do you remember where in France? I do, but I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Eddie Rugmain and these are my places. There are lots of places from the films that I've made that stand out for me. My first professional film, ah, oh, was so much fun. That was a film called Like Minds, and it was at a time when I think great Australian actors were going back to Australia to make small films to support the Australian film industry. And Tony Collette had committed to doing this film, weirdly set in an English boarding school in England in the freezing winter, but because half of the money and half of the actors were Australian, we shot half of it in a set in Adelaide in Australia in the dumbfounding heat. Basically, Tom Sturridge, uh, who, uh, who's one of my best mates, through that film, we got cast and we just flew off to Australia for months. And they even kind of encouraged us to stay in Australia over Christmas. So Tom and I stayed in Australia over Christmas. It was like a kind of dream holiday. But I'll also never forget, because just before we started filming in Australia, I had to fly to New York to screen test for a film called The Good Shepherd with um, Robert De Niro, who was directing it. The Australian film allowed me to do that if I flew straight from New York to Adelaide and started rehearsal the second I arrived. I went for my audition in New York, got on the plane, and it was various planes, uh, like full 24 hours of travel to get there. And I decided that I was gonna take a sleeping pill each time I got on a plane. So I slept the entire way there. And then when I arrived in Adelaide, I got straight off the plane and I basically slept for 24 hours, but I was still convinced that I was going to be tired, so I took a kind of caffeine p pill. And I did my first day rehearsal with Tony Collette, and I thought it had gone quite well, and I'd managed this travel quite brilliantly, you know, sleep and then caffeine. And I came for my second day of rehearsal, and Tony was like, you were an insane person yesterday. And I was like, I, it transpired that I thought I'd been totally normal as about the day before in rehearsal, but I'd been basically acting like a madman because I was so overslept and high on caffeine. So that was quite humiliating. My week with Marilyn, oh, the location I remember is a scene that we shot in Hatfield House. There's a scene where Colin Clark went swimming with Marilyn Monroe and it's meant to be this bucolic day they have in the summer. We shot it in sort of midwinter in England and we were shooting at Hatfield House, which is a beautiful Elizabethan house. And there was a lake there and Michelle Williams and I had to go and swim and we could survive for about four seconds, but it was meant to look summery and beautiful. And they had a they had a whole tent with a kind of jacuzzi in it in order that we didn't get hypothermia afterwards. So that's my memory of Hatfield House, which is a very beautiful place and well worth a visit. Les Miserables, ooh. Well, the riveting thing about Les Miserables was that we didn't get to shoot in Paris, uh, which is becoming a recurrent theme, but they reconstructed uh, uh, Paris in Pinewood Studios. One of the reasons that you know, we didn't go to Paris with Les Miserables was that all the singing in it was shot live, which meant they had to record all the singing live, which meant that singing outdoors, the sound disappears. And so all the big barricades and street scenes had to be built inside at, at Pinewood. I love getting to travel. You know, one of the great you know, perks of doing what I do is traveling around the world and particularly Paris. I was slightly gutted. Theory of everything. Well, I suppose the weirdness for me shooting the theory of everything was going back to Cambridge. I was very nervous when I was making that film. Um, the stakes were high, but it was weird because going back to, to, to shoot a film in a city that you know incredibly well, but I wasn't there to be a student. I was staying in a hotel that was directly opposite my art history campus when I was at university. But my head was so in the, the zone of making the film that it was only one day when my mum sent me a text message going, isn't it weird to think that 10 years on after leaving Cambridge, you're back there getting to play Stephen Hawking. It was only that moment I sort of pulled my head out my ass and kind of looked at it all and took it in and, and realized how lucky I was. One of the things I love about Fantastic Beasts, so they're shot at Leavesden in, um, in just outside Watford, where the, 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 there used to be, I think, air hangers, or they made zeppelins there. And, and when the Potter films were made, these things, Warner Brothers bought them and transformed them into studios. And it's now where you can go on the Harry Potter tours. And they're amazing places. But what I love is Warner Brothers have painted them that iconic sandy color of the LA Warner Brothers studios. But like for me, those studios are so iconic when like juxtaposed with a bright blue LA sky and like a palm tree. <laughs> what I love is when I drive drive into the Leafs and Studios past the kind of Potter tour and everything on a really sort of grotty sort of Monday morning at 6 a.m. and everything and that sort of beautiful sunny sandy color of the studios doesn't quite have the desired effect for me. 
Oh, we we shot uh, we shot some of the second Fantastic Beasts movie in Highgate Cemetery, which is filled with amazing people. Uh, but we shot in the middle of the night. As the Harry Potter films came out, one by one they came out, my mate and I would go and see them all. And each one, like the review for each Harry Potter film always ended up being like so much darker than the last one. There's so much, as it got more serious and operatic towards the end. Anyway, we were shooting the second Fantastic Beasts movie, literally in the middle of the night in Highgate Cemetery, surrounded by ghouls and ghosts. And I sort of took a photo of one of the, uh, the graveyards and I sent it to my mate, just going, just to let you know, this one's so much darker than the last one. <laughs> it's like, it could not get any darker. It's like, literally in a graveyard at night. Okay, so here's the thing with travel and Fantastic Beasts. When I uh, got together with my wife, I said, Okay, my, I'd been living, I'd shot Yellow Handkerchief in New Orleans. I'd been in North Carolina. I'd spent years in Budapest shooting all these. I said to my wife, Anna, I was like, our life is going to be nomadic. And she's much more free spirit than I. And she was really up for that. She's like, great, let's do it. Ever since then, basically theory of everything, set in Cambridge, London. So shot in London, basically. Danish girl set in Copenhagen, mostly shot in London. Fantastic Beast 1 set in New York, shot in Watford. Fantastic Beast 2 set in Paris, shot in Watford. It's only finally that I'm doing this film at the moment called The Trial of the Chicago 7 that we've got to all come and my wife was like, wait a second, you promised that we'd get to travel and only now are we finally doing it. The Aeronauts was the real flight element of the Aeronauts. They built this balloon, uh, this gas balloon, which ha there haven't been gas balloons really in Britain for a long, long time. We would leave from Oxford or just outside Oxford and you'd leave it first thing in the morning when there weren't too many winds and, and you'd head up. And the amazing thing was we would drift over Oxford and you would see the balloon reflected in these lakes and the spires of the city in the mist. And, and the amazing thing when you're at that relatively low height is that people like walking their dogs because it's silent. Walking their dogs, they'd shout out, they go, morning! And you go, morning. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget getting to see Oxford from that site. If you ever get the opportunity to go in an air balloon over Oxford, it's a very, very beautiful thing. I, I suppose the place I was most excited to, to shoot many years ago was, uh, was in New Orleans. There was a film called The Yellow Handkerchief with Kristen Stewart and William Hurt and Maria Bello. And, and my character was an adopted Native American from Northern Oklahoma. And he was this very eccentric kid who had, had done a road trip in the movie. And so I got to go and do the, the, the road trip before we started filming with a wonderful man called Tez. And he and I would just go and stay in these weird motels. And they'd given us a load of cash to pay, which was in a Crown Royal bag. And the two of us would turn up, this sort of lanky English guy, this massive American guy. And, they, and people would arrive late at night you know, to, to check in. To, and the people would look at us like we were something out of a Coen Brothers movie, not quite sure what we were doing or what we were gonna. But I got to go to some beautiful places. There are two places, theater-wise, that have like emotional, pulls and ties to me. One is the uh, Donmar Warehouse, which is in London. Uh, it's in Covent Garden. It's this tiny theatre that punches extraordinarily above its weight. And I was lucky early on in my career to do a couple of plays there. And you have an intimacy with an audience that is, they're literally sitting in your, virtually in your lap. Uh, and that's thrilling. And then the other, which stemmed from there, I did a play called Red, which was about Mark Rothko with Alfred Molina. And it started at the Donmar and then it transferred to the Golden Theatre in New York. And, and the, the play was set in the Bowery, it was set in New York. And the way the theatre community in New York works is, is dumbfounding. All the theatres back onto each other. So you would share a back alley, like you'd kind of link go out of your theatre after a matinee and the Phantom of the Opera would be having a cigarette. And I remember Lucy Liu was doing a play at the time and she would kind of come in looking incredibly glamorous. And yeah, all these different plays were happening, but sharing this back kind of artery was amazing. And also the sense of community there. They have this thing in, um, in New York that often before your first performance, so before your live performance, your last dress rehearsal is called a gypsy run. All the other actors and crew members of, of Broadway shows are invited for free to come and see that so you as an actor can experience what that's like in front of an audience. And I remember Alfred Molina, who had experienced Broadway in a way that I hadn't, said, Eddie, this will be the loveliest audience you ever experienced. And they were, and it was the most generous audience ever. And at the end of that, there was a little note written in the stage door as I left. And it was from 
Zoe Kazan, wonderful actor who was working in the theatre next door and she and her boyfriend Paul Dano were, were, lived around and they said we saw you in the play and if you ever want to grab a drink and, and they've become two of my closest friends and so I always think of weirdly the, the stage door and the Golden Theatre and that whole experience as being very special. My hometown is London, England. I grew up by the Thames, which is kind of the focus of London, and more and more has become the kind of lifeblood of the city. One of the things I've loved watching over my lifetime is how down on the south bank of the Thames has become this great, vibrant, kind of very European feel. It was kind of weirdly with the creation of the Globe Theatre. It became this cultural hub that now has food festivals, it has Christmas markets, and I feel like that has become the focus of the city in the most wonderful way. And you get to see all of the architecture, whether the new stuff from the city or up framing St. Paul's, the old Christopher Wren architecture, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a great way, kind of intro to the city, I feel. Some of my favorite establishments in London, when I was younger, long before getting to play Wizards, I was really into magic. So there's a subway which you go down to walk underneath roads and to get to the tube station, I think, and and just, it, it's sort of slightly grotty, smells of sort of um, urine. Uh, but there is also a very dark little shop there, which is a, a, a magic shop called Davenport's. It's where sort of professional magicians would go and, and buy their kit. And as a kid, I would go and stand there and save up my pocket money to go and go and buy things from there. For a long time, I lived in Borough Market, uh, or by Borough Market, which is again down by the South Bank, and that place is foodie heaven. The one piece of counsel I would give is try everything, and try before you buy, because you can get an entire meal just trying tiny samples. They're, they're gonna hate me for this, for trying tiny, tiny samples of cheese, but then when you start committing to purchasing, you take a wad of cash, because it's very expensive. I had an amazing time at university. I went to Cambridge, which is one of the most beautiful cities in the UK. Cambridge is almost like an art gallery. The buildings present themselves, whether it's King's, you know, the most famous chapel, which is breathtaking, or the, the, the Trinity Great Court. They're, they're, they're staggering places. And there are these choral scholars, university students, who, who sing these really stunning choirs that are singing Evensong twice a week three times a week, five times a week sometimes, for free in some of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And often there are very few people there listening. The quality of music in those places is, is, is stunning. So that's my, that's my tourist <laughs> suggestion. Um, I did have a home away from home. So when, when I was very little, my parents bought a little battered uh, farmhouse in the, in the south of France. And so that's where we would go and spend uh, long summers, yeah. The Côte d'Azur and, and that part of the world remains somewhere that has this infectious pull. All the pointillist artists of like Signac and even Seurat and then Matisse, they all found the Côte d'Azur and Saint-Tropez and all that part deeply um, alluring and, and I can see why. One of the things I love also about what the, the job that I do is you work and then you have a bit of time off and so it allows you, to, like my wife and I, after the first Fantastic Beasts movie, we moved to Paris for a few months and, and which is a great indulgence and luxury, but you get to go and spend little times in different cities. And I'm also a really indecisive person, so what I love again about how this job has pushed me is that you don't choose. You don't get to choose where you go. You're, the job dictates where you go and as a consequence you get to see the world, which is heavenly. And work with actors from different parts of the world and work with crews from different parts of the world. So rather than necessarily just being a tourist and, and getting to skim along the top, you, you meet these people, the crew or the other actors who give you a little inroad to their hometowns and their cities. So yeah, it's great luxury. I'm Eddie Redmayne and those are my places. <laughs>